This plane right here, you can open your laptops, is a U-2 spy plane. Okay, that wingspan, it's over 100 feet long. In the 1950s, our military and intelligence agencies said, hey, we need a way to spy on what the Soviets are doing, especially their nuclear development. Where are they putting missiles at? Where are they testing them? We need this new aircraft. Now, all of this is before satellites. Sputnik is not in space yet, which is the first satellite. The Soviets beat us into space. So we don't have satellites that can take pictures. Next best thing, the U-2 spy plane. Okay, so in the 1950s, we start building these. These things fly 70,000 feet in the air and have high-speed, powerful cameras built into them. Okay? They're not for dropping bombs. They don't have rockets or missiles or guns. They have cameras, and they're more important than any weapon we have because at 70,000 feet high, the Soviets don't even know we're there. And even if they could tell that plane was flying over the Soviet Union, the highest a Soviet fighter can fly at this point in history is 45,000 feet. That's halfway up to our spy plane. They can't shoot it down. And they have no missiles that can shoot that high. So this thing is essentially invisible. It is in space. Okay? And I'm going to show you what it looks like from a YouTube spy plane. Um, this guy on the BBC did this thing where they let him fly in a U-2 spy plane. So here's what it looks like. He's taken off. You have to pretty much wear a spacesuit. We still have about 20 of these in service today. And they're over 60 years old. So if you've ever been like on a passenger aircraft, you can get above the clouds on an average day like 20,000 feet high. If you're at 10,000 feet, you need oxygen and you're about two miles high. Okay, so there's like a Boeing passenger aircraft. That thing's not even half as high as they are. So if you didn't hear what they're saying, if you're not in the cockpit right now, you were just like walking out wearing what you're wearing, this is low space. Your skin would boil in an instant. You would die, and there's not enough oxygen to breathe. Okay? Imagine how powerful the cameras are to take pictures from 70,000 feet up. I did the math on my phone there because I'm not good at mental math. That's over 13 miles away if you're at 70,000 feet. You've got to have some pretty powerful cameras. Okay? So hopefully that gives you an idea of what a U-2 spy plane is and what it's capable of. Okay? What we're going to do is I'm going to put you in one of five teams. In this entire week, you're going to work for the CIA. The coolest thing about this is what you are going to look at are the actual pictures from U-2 spy planes, some other ones we'll talk about, and actual sources of intelligence that the CIA had in 1962. 
So for two weeks' time, we were on edge with the Soviet Union and Cuba, and probably the closest we ever got to a nuclear war. So I'm going to give you a number. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two. If you are a one, you're going to come right over here with Kim. Bring your laptop. If you're a two, Maggie's going to start team two back here by this table. Maggie, here's yours on this table right here. Okay. Threes are going to be dead center. Who's a three? Perfect. Threes are on Donovan. Who's a four over here? Is anybody a four? Fours are going to be right here on Mr. Dankelman. Who's a five? Fives are on Mr. Hatcher. Fours on Dankelman, fives on Hatcher. Let's go. You need your laptop. Let me show you what we're doing, and then you can. Give me 90 seconds, all right? You will need your laptops. Not at first, but you're going to need them. It's okay. Uh, welcome to my morning, Kim. Okay, so here's what's going down. It is October 1962. President Kennedy is in office. Okay? It was said that the Cuban Missile Crisis was perhaps intelligence's finest hour. In retrospect, it was the combined intelligence from the U-2 overflights, which the acronym is MINT, that stands for Imagery Intelligence, just looking at pictures, basically. As well as critical human intelligence, HUMINT, human intelligence, from Cuban nationals and from a Soviet informant, like a spy that we had in the Soviet Union, that enabled President Kennedy to formulate a strategy involving a blockade rather than full-out military attack. It is only in recent years that declassified intelligence has allowed scholars and lay people to fully understand how very critical the various sources of intelligence were in enabling the U.S. to fully understand the situation. The U-2 overflight photos prove that there were MRBMs, or medium-range ballistic missiles, <clears throat> uh, in Cuba, and reports from Cuban nationals confirmed that large missiles were being shipped into the country as well as an influx of Soviet personnel. And finally, the iron bark material from Oleg Penkovsky, that was our secret source in the Soviet military, provided the U.S. with critical intelligence enabling analysts to determine not only the type of missiles at the installation sites, but how much time it would take before the missiles were operable. It wasn't until after the crisis that it was discovered how very close the United States came to nuclear war with the Soviets. When medium-range ballistic missile sites were dismantled, it was revealed that not only were there three medium-range offensive nuclear-tipped missiles, but also short-range defensive-tipped nuclear missiles, or frogs. Think for a moment what would have happened if President Kennedy had given the order to invade Cuba. As U.S. troops approached the island, the order would have likely been given to fire the short-range missiles. If American troops were under nuclear attack, President Kennedy would have likely retaliated by ordering nuclear weapons launched into the Soviet Union, and then we would have been at nuclear war. If it weren't for the critical piece of intelligence from Penkovsky adding to the already gathered U-2 overflight photos, we might not have had, we might have had World War III. This is why Penkovsky is referred to as the spy who saved the world. If you come Friday, part three is about him. His code name was Ironbark. So, time to see how you do as a CIA source analyst. Okay, and we're going to have decisions for each day. The best part about this is all of the intelligence that you look at this week is exactly word for word, picture for picture, what guys and ladies in the CIA would have looked at in October of 1962, because now it's declassified. Okay? So, here's how the roles work. I'm the um, task force chief, and you guys are analysts. So nobody's the president. We just work for the CIA. Okay? Here's the 
big question that we're trying to solve this week. Should the United States send a U-2 spy plane over Cuba to ascertain if there are medium-range ballistic missile installation sites? And I know what you're thinking. Why wouldn't we send this U-2 spy plane over Cuba to take pictures? Because we suspect that the Cubans have said, hey, Soviets, put some medium-range missiles on our island 90 miles away from Florida, which would give us a five-minute warning when they launch. Okay? So you're thinking, why wouldn't we? Here's what we're going to look at, is some intelligence. Okay? We have reason to believe that there's activity on the island of Cuba and that they're installing offensive missiles. We know in the past the Soviets have provided Cuba with short-range defensive missiles. However, their diplomats have repeatedly assured us they would not install offensive missiles. The medium-range ballistic missiles, known as MRBMs, are capable of striking the U.S. Okay? Cuba is a mere 95 miles off the coast of Florida. The latest national intelligence estimate produced by our analysts also indicates the Soviets would not install medium-range missiles. Okay. However, the past several months, we've been receiving conflicting intelligence from sources inside Cuba telling us that the Soviets are indeed installing these offensive missiles. If they are, this would be the first time the Soviets put nuclear missiles in someone else's country besides their own. At least the Soviet Union's far away from us. Cuba's 90 miles away. Okay. August 29th, we sent a U-2 spy plane over Cuba to take pictures. August 29th, that was two months ago, there was no suspicious activity, okay? Now, we stopped U-2 flights after August 29th. Why did we do that? Okay, a few months ago, one of our U-2 pilots was shot down over China, which caused the United States government a huge embarrassment because the Chinese knew we were spying on them, okay? That was in 1962, we also lost a U-2 spy plane over the Soviet Union in 1960, two years ago. The Soviets shot down one of our U-2 spy planes. Our pilot bailed out. All of our U-2 pilots have a poison capsule they can take so that if they're captured, they can kill themselves rather than give up any secrets. The problem is parachuting from 70,000 feet high takes a while to hit the ground. And the Soviets were waiting for him when he hit the ground. They captured him. They put him on trial, charged him with espionage, spying, and sentenced him to 10 years in a Soviet prison. That makes us look bad, and that sucks for the pilot. So if you haven't already figured this out, in the 1950s, the U-2 was untouchable by Soviet missiles and aircraft. They have a new surface-to-air missile that can reach 70,000 feet. How do we know? They've shot down two of our U-2 spy planes in the last two years. So here's the big decision today. Should the CIA advise President Kennedy to order more flights over Cuba, knowing that if these missiles, we call them SA-2s, are in Cuba, they could shoot down our U-2 spy plane, killing the pilot, capturing them, causing an incident where the Soviets go, you're spying on Cuba, let's launch these nuclear missiles and we all die. So the U-2 is not untouchable. Okay. Besides flying really high, here's the problem with the U-2. Right now it's about seven years old, so the Soviets caught up. Max speed is only 500 miles an hour. This thing goes Mach 0.7. It can't even go the speed of sound. So once the Soviets get missiles that can reach 70,000 feet, this thing is slow as heck. Because to take good pictures, you can't be going 1,000 miles an hour, right? So this is a slow plane, and the Soviets now have surface-to-air missiles that can shoot it down because they've shot two down in the last two years. Okay. So our question is, should we advise the president to send a U-2 flight over Cuba if we think there are missiles? So here's what you have. Unpaper clip your little packet. Close your laptop lid because the Internet's not cooperating. We don't need it for a couple minutes. Based on the intelligence that CIA sources have gathered, here's what you have. U-2 photograph from August 29th. Okay, I've emphasized this before. I'm going to reiterate it one more time. These are the exact pictures 
that CIA intelligence analysts looked at in 1962. It's not like a recreation. This stuff got declassified. Okay? Showing this missile site in August. On the back of that, you can see a memorandum on Cuba where the CIA talks about um, what's going on in Cuba, different reports. Okay? There's seven different sources of intelligence. You have three or four people on your team. I need you to look at that intelligence and come to this conclusion. Your suspicion of missiles in Cuba, based on this evidence you have right here, does it warrant sending a U-2 flight over Cuba to take new pictures? Knowing that the Soviets could shoot it down if they have these SA-2s, and that two of the U-2s have been shot down the last two years. Okay, so think of it like this. If you look through this intelligence and it doesn't look like Cuba has missiles, let's not risk a U-2 flight. Does that make sense? If you look at this intelligence and say, ooh, it looks like the Cubans are getting medium-range ballistic missiles, it's worth the risk of sending a U-2 to take new pictures. Because the last pictures we have are from August. It's now October. You could easily deploy nuclear missiles in two months. Okay? So you need to split that up however you want. And you have 10 minutes to analyze that and say, what evidence do we see of ballistic missile activity in Cuba? The big question of the day, if you saw in Canvas, what are at least two sources of evidence you can cite in your recommendation to the CIA director, should we send the U-2 flight or not, based on two sources of your choice from this intelligence. So then all you have to do when we're done is, as a group, say, should we risk the U-2 flight or not? If so, here's two pieces of evidence that make us think it's worth the risk, or two that make us think it's not. Turn that in in Canvas, and part one is done. Okay? So divide